Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Bassam Zawadi, and I pray that all of you and your families are safe and well. Uh, many of you heard or heard about Dr. Yasser Qadi's recent video on the notion of ibadah and the Najdi da'wah, which he uploaded on his YouTube channel on February 8th, 2021, last week. Uh, he primarily touched upon why he left the Athari school. He also discussed the notion of ibadah and tried to contrast between uh, the stance of Sheikh Sam ibn Taymiyyah and Sheikh Muhammad bin Abdul Wahhab. Uh, he also spent a good amount of time uh, criticizing um, uh, ibn Abdul Wahhab and the Najdi Dawah. So, inshallah, I'll be offering uh, a few remarks and I'll try my best to not take too much of your time. Uh, and I do want to say, uh, before I begin, that this video may come across as being more directed towards etheries, uh, as some of the assumptions underlying much of what I say uh, uh, pres presumes that. Uh, moreover, uh, there will be certain things that I will not be determined to discuss and address in detail, uh, uh, as they are uh, things which are already well established uh, in the Athari school. Nevertheless, uh, everyone is free to listen and, and benefit, inshallah. So the first thing to discuss is, is ibadah. What is ibadah? Uh, when does a certain act or utterance constitute ibadah? Now, we could start off by offering a, a very simplified response to that question by saying that ibadah is is anything, be it an act, speech, or 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 action of the heart, that should only be directed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala and none other than Him. Now that is a fairly uncontroversial definition, which nobody would really disagree with. Now, however, just like with uh, any definition or or foundational principle or maxim, once you begin to probe and and uh, you know you be you begin to get forced to articulate yourself better and provide more clarity to the terms and principles uh, that 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 you, that you adopt. So again, what really is uh, ibadah? Now, the majority of classical linguists uh, and 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 scholars. Uh, have defined ibadah as that conscious or intentional state uh, or frame of mind uh, which constitutes feelings of utmost humility and and uh, submission. And uh, those feelings uh, go on to stir that individual to cling on to something or somebody and to submit to its will and, and perform actions to please it, uh, or 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 the or the person. Um, now, what do we mean by utmost humility and utmost submission? Well, they are those actions or utterances or actions of the heart uh, which are expressions of servitude and and praise only owed to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It is to establish a relationship whether continuously or, or temporarily, with somebody or something, on, in a manner only worthy of establishing with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Once again, uh, how do we identify uh, what those actions and utterances are? Well, here we need to <clears throat> excuse me, uh, look to the Qur'an and Sunnah and see how the ulama have understood them and try to weigh and consider the differences of opinion on the matter. Now, when it comes to ibadah, when it comes to ibadah, we can break ibadah down into two different categories. Um, uh, you, you, first category are those acts that are inherently ibadah; they are unconditionally ibadah. And the second category are acts that are conditionally ibadah. So, looking at the first one, uh, acts that are that are uh, inherently ibadah. Now, these are these are uh, inherently expressions of utmost servitude and utmost humility uh, being directed 
you know, they are they are expressions of utmost humility and servitude when they are di being directed to a being. So, for example, um, uh, um, acts which are uniquely known through Islamic teachings, like for example, the five salawat, uh, Hajj and Umrah as complete sets with all their components, fasting in Ramadan, uh, etc. So these are inherently acts of ibadah, regardless of what your intention is when you direct these acts to somebody. Uh, so, for example, let's say that you have a wealthy and arrogant uh, hater of Islam. Okay, Let, let's call him, let's call him Kevin. Okay, um, let's say Kevin comes up to a Muslim and he says to him, I want you to make wudu and I want you to pray in the same exact manner as you do to your God, Allah, but to me. And I want you to openly declare your intention uh, that you direct your Maghrib Salah to me, Kevin. And in return, I'll give you a million dollars. Right? So here, um, in this hypothetical scenario, the Muslim says to himself, okay, um, let me do that and uh, because I want to get the money. He's speaking purely out of greed and I can make tawbah later because Allah ghafoorun rahim. And he made wudu, openly declared, I am directing my maghrib salah to Kevin and he did it. Now here, the Muslim did not intend to take Kevin as a god. He did not intend in his heart to worship Kevin. All he really wanted was the million dollars. But he willingly, openly declared that he is directing his salah to his maghrib salah to Kevin. Is this an act of major shirk? The answer is absolutely yes. Um, other acts which are inherently uh, uh, ibadah are, uh, you know, involve actions or or utterances uh, which presume that the that the object of veneration uh, or invoking or du'a uh, has characteristics or abilities which only Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has. So, for example, you know, examples which you know the ulama mention are things like. Um, forgiveness of sins, uh, granting hidayah, uh, legislation of what is halal and haram, etc. So, you know, unlike salah and hajj, these things are not unique to Islam because other religions have this understanding of istighfar and, and, and divine guidance and, and, and so on. So they aren't unique to Islam, but still, no one could forgive your sins in a manner in which they are wiped, wiped off the scales, weighing your deeds, uh, other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Period. Full stop. And so if somebody were to say that God assigned somebody to, uh, you know, assign somebody the full discretional authority to forgive people's sins, and as a result, we make tawbah to that somebody and repent to that somebody, uh, believing that God gave him this authority to forgive sins, this is still an act of major shirk. Why? Because forgiveness of sins is from the, the khasa'is al-rububiyyah. It is something which only Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does. Uh, similarly, uh, legislation, of, legislation of what is morally and ethically halal and haram uh, the, the Quran in Surah at tawbah uh, Ayah 31, accused the Jews and Christians of taking their rabbis and priests as lords, uh, 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 you know, with Allah. And, uh, you know, the, the Jews and Christians, they did not believe, they did not, they do not believe that their Christian, that their priests and their rabbis independently uh, legislate what is halal and haram for them. 
if you take the Catholics, uh, for example, they believe that Peter, uh, the, the Apostle of Christ, was the first Pope, and, and that he had authority from Christ to legislate uh, uh, what is halal and haram. They appeal to the Gospel of Matthew, uh, uh, chapter 16, uh, verse 19, and, um, uh, you know, in order to prove this, uh, and, and they believe that this authority was transmitted down from Peter to every pope uh, who, uh, that, that came after him. So even though they did not believe that their rabbis, even though they do not believe that their rabbis and their priests, uh, you know, uh, act independently of God's will, uh, the mere fact that they believe that their that their rabbis and priests legislate uh, were were given the authority to legislate uh, what is halal and haram for them, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, according to Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, entails that they treated them as lords, and this is despite them not intending to take them as lords. Now, it's very important that we understand that this is what Jews and Christians believe. Any Jew or Christian that you speak to will say, yeah, of course, you know, we believe that God gave them the authority to legislate what is halal and haram for us. Yet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala declared that to be shirk. And obviously, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala understands the beliefs of these Jews and Christians. Now, this is the first category of ibadah. So the, these are acts and utterances and actions of the heart which are inherently ibadah, regardless of what you believe about the one or thing you're directing these acts to. The second category uh, are, uh, you know, are conditional acts of ibadah. So these are acts which, um, which uh, only amount to ibadah if they are accompanied by certain conditions. So let's take sujood, for example. Uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah and several others, um, probably most, most scholars, I, I, I believe, uh, were of the view that sujood is a conditional act of ibadah. Why? Because, I mean, in their view, sujood is a kind of subservience, a kind of submission, not inherently the ultimate and utmost kind of submission um you know for example you have sujood of respect and you have sujood uh, of greeting sujood you know tahiyya uh, right so now now obviously that doesn't mean that pros that prostrations to Allah, to other than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh you know are halal in our sharia but they're not unconditionally major acts of shirk either uh now when the sujood amount to an act of worship well scholars would look at a, a, a number of factors which would serve as indicators uh, as to whether the sajda in question uh, you know as you know was performed in a manner uh, of utmost servitude and humility so um, for example uh, you know if the, se the, se the sajda could become ibadah if the person intended to direct it toward an entity he believed to be divine. Now, that's a simple and clear scenario. Everybody agrees with this. This is fairly un uncontroversial. But let's think about another scenario. Um, another indicator that sajda amounts to ibadah is if it's performed uh, to entities that are not known by custom to be uh, uh, to be a sajda of greeting or a sajda of, of 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 mere respect. So, for example, making sujood to the sun uh, and the moon and the planets. Th this is major shirk, and this is even if the person making the sajda does not affirm that the sun, moon, and planets are God. Um, uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah uh, has an interesting statement uh, uh, in his Dar uh, al-Ta'arud Bain al-Aql wa naql volume 1, pages 227 uh, to 228. Um, he, he states, and I quote, From among the followers of the polytheists, 
is one who prostrates to the sun and the moon and the planets and calls upon them like he calls upon Allah and fasts for them and slaughters for them and strives to seek closeness to them. And then he proceeds to claim, this is not shirk. Rather, shirk is when one believes that they are the managers of my affairs. But if we make them a means and intercessors, we would not be rendered mushrik. And then Ibn Taymiyyah uh, goes on to say, And it is known by necessity in the religion of Islam that this is shirk. Uh, so, uh, so notice that Sheikh al-Islam, what Sheikh al-Islam is saying here, uh, he's rebuking these people for, for saying that they are not committing shirk because they don't believe that these entities govern the affairs of creation. Um, um, uh, uh, an, an, an anecdote, which uh, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, an, act, an anecdote which uh, relates to this, could be read in uh, Ibn Arabi's Al Futuhat Al Makkiyah. Yes, the con the controversial uh, Ibn Arabi, um, in in volume seven, page four hundred twenty six. Um, he mentioned. He mentions that he that he spoke to uh, one of the sun worshippers and inquired about why he and others worship the sun, uh, and the person responded by saying uh, that they don't believe that the sun is God. On the contrary, they believe that the sun is a poor servant of God, Abdun Fakir. However, they still glorify the sun because they realize that. It's a blessing and grace from God to them, and they hope that in worshiping the sun, that the sun would intercede from for for them. Um, and uh, you know, you could also see uh, Imam Shahristani's uh, Kitab al Milal al Nihal, where he discusses the beliefs uh, of various religions and and sects in Islam. And uh, in his book. Uh, he he describes the beliefs of sun and moon and water worshippers and if and, and a whole host of other belief systems, and when you read those descriptions of their beliefs, you will see that there are various religions and beliefs out there that w w you know which teach that people should worship things that they don't even believe to be God. Um, people people worship. A whole host of things. They they worship their dead ancestors. They 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 worship their uh, animal spirits. They they worship demons, uh, which is why you have uh, some scholars such as Imam Al Qurtubi saying uh, that seeking refuge in the jinn without Allah uh, could be shirk and kufr. And uh, for example, right. So I mean, the point here is that um, that 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 one is directing his 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 veneration to entities in which it cannot be said to be something customary and part of a given culture. So yes, we we make ruku' to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you know, in some cultures bowing might be a form of greeting. And we make sujood to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but you know, in certain customs um making uh, sujood to the king might be a show of great respect. But when it comes to planets and stars and fire, because you have fire worshippers as well, and whatnot, these, no, the, the, the connotations here are clearly religious in nature. So, you know, uh, uh, as we said, I mean, uh, you know, so, I mean, this, uh, as we said, is, 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 is also an indicator for, for when a particular conditional act of ibadah, such as sujood, could evolve uh, into ibadah. Um, another indicator for determining when a conditional act of ibadah, you know, amounts to ibadah, is when the conditional act of ibadah, such as sujood, is directed to an entity which is known to be a god in another belief system. So, for example, it could be it could be a, a pagan idol, or it could be a statue of Jesus, uh, etc. Right. So here, if one were to direct an act of sajda to these entities, it would still be a major act. It would it would be a major act of shirk, uh, and that's even if the person that does it uh, is only doing so out of respect. Right. Uh, you know, even if he says, "I'm only doing this out of respect for the religion of others." 
and I'm and I'm only doing it in order to display a great level of tolerance for other faiths, and and I'm doing this in the name of religious uh, of religious pluralism, and I don't actually believe in my heart that these are gods, and all these other excuses. It doesn't matter. It's still an act of major shirk, and um, uh, you know another indicator. Uh, 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 to know when the conditional act of ibadah constitutes ibadah is when is when the the act, such as sujud, sticking to the example of sujud, you know, begins to display characteristics and features uh, with uh, you know of of other actions which we do know to be ibadah. So, for example, if the sujud to a particular object or person. Is being done very frequently, and is uh, and is being done with khushur and with humility and with subservience and with an intention to please and to seek uh, closeness uh, to that object or person. Then all the then yeah then these all collectively together you know serve serve as a sign that this act has evolved to the status of ibadah. Uh, you know, uh, you know, as such kinds of of sujud do not exhibit characteristics and features of customary prostrations of 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 greeting and mere respect. Rather, they appear to have escalated to something beyond that. And you know, for each category of conditional acts of worship, one could identify different indicators. So there might be different indicators to assess when it comes to slaughtering. Uh, 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 or, or, or seeking refuge, or istighatha, etc. And it is up to, it is up, you know, and it is the job of the theologians and the jurists and the judges, you know, who specialize in these issues, to to identify these sorts of indicators and parameters uh, for us. So to kind of bring this part of my uh, my video to a close, we, we see that there are two kinds of acts of ibadah. Those acts which are inherently ibadah, such as salah, fasting of Ramadan, uh, seeking forgiveness of sins, asking for hidayah, etc. And then you have those acts which are conditional acts of ibadah. Um, and in that domain of conditional acts of ibadah, you have clear cases and you have gray areas which may involve a a a, uh, a level of ishtihad in determining whether a given act in a specific context has progressed to the level or status of ibadah. Uh, and that could only be reliably determined by investigating what the person is doing and why he's doing it. Um, so, in light of all this, in light of all this, when, when Dr. Qadi, when Dr. Yasser Qadi says that an act of veneration uh, towards a given entity could never could never amount to an act of worship unless the person intends to take that uh, entity as a god because بالنيات, and that our intentions ultimately influence that the label you know assigned to our to our actions uh, we strongly disagree with this um, because when it comes to acts that are inherently ibadah, intent to worship is irrelevant at this point. The only thing that is relevant is whether the person intended to perform that act and direct it to that being. That's all that matters. Um, the act itself, if performed, is an act of worship regardless of one's inner intention to take the object as a deity or not. Now, when it comes to conditional acts of ibadah, yes, intentions of taking a deity could play a role uh, in helping us determine whether a conditional act of ibadah has evolved to the level of ibadah. But it's not the only ultimate and decisive factor. For, as I just explained, there are other indicators and factors to consider um, and, and conditional acts of ibadah could evolve into ibadah even if you do not intend to take that object as a deity because there are people who worship objects uh, without you know believing that they are they are God um, uh, but it must be noted 
it must be noted that intent to worship, intent to worship, and uh, you know, intent to take the object as a deity, plays a more important role in determining the ruling of the person who engages in these acts. So there is the act, and then there is the actor. Uh, and this is something which Sheikh Islam Ibn Taymiyyah uh, has spoken about. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah recognized that most Muslims who commit major acts of shirk are severely ignorant and do not intend to worship the saints and objects they are venerating. Um, let's take a, a, a look at a uh, you know, at a, at, a, at a couple of quotes here. Now, in um, in Jami' al um, in Jami' al Masail, in Jami' al Masail, Volume Three, pages one hundred and fifty to one hundred and fifty-one, we find Ibn Taymiyyah discussing the kind of shirk which the Meccan polytheists engaged in, and. After mentioning that they worship their gods by invoking them and taking them as intercessors, uh, he said the following, and I, and I quote, and I quote, if a person is provided the evidence against this type of shirk, and he continues to indulge in it, he is to be executed in the same way a polytheist would be executed. He is not to be buried in a Muslim graveyard, nor is he preyed upon. As for one who is ignorant and knowledge hasn't reached him, and he is unaware of what shirk entails, the type that the Prophet ﷺ fought over against a polytheist, then such an individual is not considered a kafir, especially since this shirk Pay attention to this, especially since this shirk has become rampant among those who claim to be Muslims. However, whoever believes these acts to be an offering and an act of, of obedience, then such a person is misguided by the agreement of all Muslims. And after the evidence has been uh, established for him, he is considered uh, a kafir. So, um, here, Ibn Taymiyyah is saying that the major shirk which the Prophet wasallam fought the polytheists over, um, uh, the polytheists of his time, the Meccans, um, uh, became rampant among those claiming to be Muslims during his time, during Ibn Taymiyyah's time. But due to their ignorance for thinking that their actions don't amount to worship, Ibn Taymiyyah excused them. And he has several statements uh, to this effect. Um, let me just give one more so that we don't dwell on this single issue for too long. Um, he said in his Qa'ida Azima fil Farqi bin Ibadat Ahlul Islami wal Imani wa Ibadat Ahlul Shirki wal Nifaq, page 70, he said, Among them are those who seek from the dead what they seek from Allah. And say, forgive me, grant me provisions, help me, and other things like that. Similar to what someone praying to Allah says in his salah, of which there is no doubt to anyone who knows the religion that it is contrary to the religion of all messengers. For it is from the shirk which Allah and his messenger prohibited. In fact, it is from the shirk which the Prophet ﷺ fought the polytheists over. Those committing these actions of shirk are to be excused due to their ignorance and due to the evidence not being established for them. And again, uh, in, in context of this statement, Ibn Taymiyyah is referring to people who claim to be Muslims during his time. So, that's Ibn Taymiyyah on excusing Muslims who fall into major shirk out of ignorance. Um, now, Dr. Qadi, Dr. Yasser Qadi, uh, um, uh, spoke about Ibn Taymiyyah and argued that his stance was different from that of, of Ibn Abdul Wahhab. Well, yes in a way and no in another. Uh, in terms of differences between the two on this subject, there are two differences worthy of note. Um, the first difference 
concerns the notion of excusing the Muslim for his ignorance uh, when he engages in acts of major shirk. Now, both of them, uh, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab, did believe in the principle of excusing people for their ignorance even when they engage in shirk. They both adopted that principle. However, it appears that Ibn Taymiyyah's uh, application of his standards for excusing people for their ignorance was different from Ibn Abdul Wahhab's. For Ibn Taymiyyah, as long as the person genuinely appeared to be ignorant, even after the evidence was provided to that person, that person could still be excused. Why? Well, be because one's ignorance may still lead him to falsely reject the evidence provided. Now, I mean, and this is even if the person is a scholar, such as uh, Al-Bakri, whom uh, Dr. Uh, Yasser Qadi uh, mentioned in his video. And the point is, is that uh, unless, you know, it's, uh, unless it's clearly demonstrated that the individual is only rejecting the evidence out of, purely out of stubbornness, instead of what, you know, outwardly appears to be sincere confusion on his part, the excuse for ignorance stands for Ibn Taymiyyah because it's possible that the person providing the evidence did not do uh, you know, uh, a sufficient job in, in, uh, in providing it. And, and, and I mean, think for yourself. How many Muslims are out there who reject what we deem to be very clearly established things from the religion, yet we don't make takfir of them even after debating them and showing them proofs? So that's kind of where Ibn Taymiyyah is coming from, even when it comes to this subject of, of, of you know, unknowingly engaging in actions of major shirk. Now, as for Ibn Abdul Wahhab, you know, it appears, wallahu alam, that what truly mattered uh, when it came to the specific issue is was whether the evidence was presented, was provided clearly or not. Uh, full stop. And so, if the person rejected the evidence, takfir would apply. So even though Ibn Abdul Wahhab did believe in excusing people for their ignorance, even in the matters of shirk, he did not go as far as Ibn Taymiyyah uh, in terms of how he extended uh, that excuse to people. So uh, that's the first difference between Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab. They differed on how far they were each willing to go in terms of extending the excuse of ignorance to those who committed major shirk. However, however, out of fairness, uh, out of fairness, um, it must be pointed out that some have argued that it's difficult to compare and contrast between Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn, Abd uh, Ibn uh, Abdul Wahhab, uh, uh, you know, on this issue because uh, Ibn Taymiyyah, they argue, was speaking in generalities as a jurist and theologian as opposed to speaking in the capacity of somebody with authority, you know, such as a judge who could issue rulings of takfir on individual people. While Ibn Abdul Wahhab, on the other hand, had power and authority. Um, some tr have tried to counter this by saying that, uh, uh, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah um, didn't seek to have al-Bakri killed when al-Bakri got in trouble with the authorities, but but that's not a very convincing argument, since al-Bakri was wanted by the authorities for an unrelated issue. And it wouldn't have been just for Ibn Taymiyyah to seek his killing for something he wasn't formally um, uh, arrested or wanted by the authorities for. Um, so, these are just some points to consider, as this is an ongoing in-house Athari debate. Um, a second uh, possible difference between Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab, and I say he, I say possible because researchers have reached different conclusions on this point. But uh, a a second possible difference is that Ibn Taymiyyah did not consider going uh, to a person's grave and calling out to that person near his grave, not from far away but near his grave and asking the dead to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant such and such 
but not asking the dead themselves to grant such and such, but rather asking the dua, uh, the dead to make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant uh, such and such favors. Uh, Ibn Taymiyyah did not consider this specific form of saint invocation to to be major shirk. Um, we, you know, I mean, this is very important. We we cannot extrapolate. Uh, we cannot extrapolate from this that Ibn Taymiyyah deemed all sorts of saint veneration and invocation uh, to be minor shirk. Uh, you know, as long as the person didn't intend to to worship the saints. No, that that is absolutely and one hundred percent false. Uh, we are just speaking about this specific form of 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 saint uh, invocation. Um, as for Ibn Abdul Wahhab, researchers have differed as to whether he deemed this particular scenario of saint invocation to also be uh, an act of major shirk. Um, so the the difference of opinion uh, must be noted, and it's it's up to each person to decide. Uh, what he thinks uh, is the stronger opinion, but but assuming that Ibn Abdul Wahhab did believe that this is major shirk, this does not mean that Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab had dramatically different usuli or foundational conceptions of ibadah. Um, they didn't. Uh, rather, they differed in terms of their ruling on this specific form of saint veneration and invocation. Um, as for calling out to the dead and asking them themselves, uh, you know, even if they, you know, even by believing that it's done with the permission of Allah, um, uh, you know, to to grant you favors and whatnot, both Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab were in agreement that this is a major uh, act of shirk. And again, you know, Ibn Taymiyyah and Ibn Abdul Wahhab are not the only ones to to deem such saint veneration and invocation uh you know uh to to be major shirk uh you know it's it, it is the official stance uh of the Hanbali madhab and that doesn't change even with Dr Yasser Qadi's attempt to cite a few solitary uh opinions uh from adherence to that madhab the, the 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 official stance of the madhab aligns with Ibn Taymiyyah's stance uh, uh, you know, as, as as many notable authorities cite him and agree with him. Now, some people try to get creative, and uh, uh, you know, when it comes to the statement of Ibn Taymiyyah, which uh, Hanbali scholars cite in agreement, and and they try to interpret the statement in a way which makes it sound like Ibn Taymiyyah only believed that those who think their saints are independent of God, have committed shirk. And it's that understanding which the, all those Hanbali scholars are agreeing with. What these people fail to understand is that these Hanbali scholars are not merely relying on one single statement of Ibn Taymiyyah. Uh, you know, they, they have studied everything that he said on the subject, and they are understanding the statement which they relay from him in alignment with everything else which he said on the subject. So it's it's an act of desperation to isolate the single statement of Ibn Taymiyyah and, and, and try to make it seem like it's saying something else. Um, I mean, for, for crying out loud, Ibn Taymiyyah said in explicit terms that the kind of shirk which the Prophet wasallam fought the polytheists over was rampant among people claiming to be Muslims during his time. What do you think he's talking about? He's not talking about people who intended to worship another god, because if that's what he thought they were saying, he would have declared them apostates. Rather, they were engaged in actions that they didn't think were major shirk, yet in reality were. And that's why Ibn Taymiyyah excused them for their ignorance. despite. Uh, you know, despite deeming their actions, you know, to constitute major shirk, Ibn Taymiyyah would not have excused them if he thought that they were saying uh, th th that their saints are independent of God. Um, he wouldn't. He would have obviously declared them. You know, he would make takfir of them individually. Um, um, 
Dr. Yasser Qadi, uh, you know, uh, said, read uh, Ibn Taymiyyah's statements in Iqtidat Sirat al-Mustaqim. Okay, fine. Um, what Ibn Taymiyyah said in Iqtidat doesn't change a thing. Uh, what we just need to make sure that we distinguish between what Ibn Taymiyyah considered to be minor shirk, namely uh, calling out to the dead near their graves uh, uh, while asking them to make dua uh, for, uh, uh, you know, uh, for you uh, on your behalf, versus what he did not consider to be minor shirk, but rather major shirk, which is asking the dead themselves to help you, calling them from far away and whatnot. So we need to look at everything uh, that he said. Um, and and you know and, and you also have you also have non hanbalis uh, you know such as Imam al Dhahabi Imam al Razi several uh, Hanafi scholars etc all pretty much saying the same thing um, you know uh, I mean the references are 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 are, are all out there and, um, and and again it's extremely important to bear in mind uh, that there are different forms of saint veneration and invocation. Um, which scholars could differ on in terms of their ruling, right? So, but you know, but that does not necessarily mean that they had completely different paradigms or conceptions of ibadah. Um, it's very possible to agree on an asl or on a foundational principle, yet differ when it comes to application. Some people don't like that idea. Okay, uh, they say, "Hey, look." You know, when it comes to Tawheed and Shirk, things must be black and white. Uh, you know, um, and as nice as that sounds, reality states otherwise. Uh, okay, there, there will always be gray areas. I mean, why do certain Islamic sects, why do certain Islamic sects um, accuse those who affirm attributes for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala why do they accuse them of shirk? Well, because in their mind, in their mind, affirming multiple attributes for Allah, in their mind, entails attributing eternality to other than Allah. Um, why do certain Islamic groups um, uh, believe that belief in in secondary causes could entail could entail shirk? Well, because they believe that. Um, that uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only musabbib, he is the only real cause of things. Not merely the ultimate cause uh, uh, of things, but rather the only real and, uh, you know, the real cause and doer of things. Uh, you know, why do scholars differ over what is an unconditional and conditional act of ibadah? Etc. So, so the differences are there, and and we need to acknowledge them. Um, and, and another thing we need to bear in mind is that not everybody who says, not everybody who says um, that uh, in invoking the dead uh, or uh, invoking the saints uh, is permissible or 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 uh, recommended. Not all of them ne necessarily have the same conception. Uh, uh, or foundational understanding of ibadah. For example, you have some that say that invoking the saints to grant you uh, grant you your request uh, isn't shirk because unless you believe that the person is helping you independently of God, well, that doesn't amount to ibadah. But others who do believe in saint veneration don't necessarily agree with that logic. Um, I mean, I mean, if, if we take uh, Ibn Hajar al-Haytami or Imam al-Subki, for example, both of these great Shafi'i jurists, um, you know, took the opinion that calling out to the dead, uh, or calling out to saints, uh, 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 is not problematic. Uh, so, for example, you know, if you were to say something like, uh, "Oh, Abdul Qadir, Oh, Abdul Qadir, help me," they wouldn't find that to be problematic. Why? Well, because linguistically speaking, linguistically speaking, it's possible that by the phrase "help me," what is really intended is "O oh, Abdul Qadir, ask Allah to help me," or you know, "Help me have Allah help me." 
Um, and, and Ibn Taymiyyah thought that there was a linguistic leeway there, and as a result, uh, relegated the, the severity of the act to minor shirk, because there was a ta'wil. So here, Imam al-Subki was not necessarily advocating this line of reasoning, that, uh, that ibadah cannot take effect unless you believe the person you're asking is independent of God. That's not the reasoning at play here. Um, However, still, when it came to other phrases like, um, um, O oh Abdul Qadir, uh, grant me a child. Here, Ibn Taymiyyah did not accept this linguistic excuse. Uh, you know, he, he did not believe that this could be passed off linguistically as meaning, O oh Abdul Qadir, ask Allah to grant me a child. You know, as he believed that the language did not accommodate such a method of speaking, and argued that such phraseology was still shirki phraseolo uh, phraseology. Uh, but obviously in his mind, Ibn Taymiyyah deemed his opponents to be sincerely incorrect and extended the excuse uh, of ignorance to them uh, as well. And, and look, there are different reasons and arguments uh, for why, uh, you know, that, that, you know that, that people use when they promote saint veneration. Um, they also have various theological presuppositions that uh, that Salafis uh, or Ashari or Atharis, whatever you want to call them, uh, do not agree with. Um, so, for instance, you have you have the doctrine you have the doctrine of of occasionalism, where secondary causes are not affirmed and cause and effect relationships aren't truly real. That's not something Atharis agree with. It's not even something that most laymen agree with. Um, yet, there are those who adopt that doctrine, and in light of that doctrine, could try to argue, and have tried to argue, that asking the dead to heal you, and grant you children, and whatnot, isn't really shirk, since it's not really they who are granting you and helping you. Um, you also have people who who disagree with Atharis on, on certain matters related to, to prophetology, nubuwat. I mean, particularly when it comes to prophetic miracles and, and karamat. Um, and, you know, and they think that the righteous in their, who are, you know, in their graves are alive and are blessed with these abilities to help and assist uh, people by the permission of Allah. And there are a host of other reasons uh, for why people advance these sorts of Pro Saint veneration arguments, um, and you know Ibn Taymiyyah recognized all this, and and he deemed that these people were sincerely confused and and ignorant. Um, he believed that in reality, even if they were unaware, uh, that their actions in reality uh, amounted to major shirk, and and you know uh, yet uh, he saw that they were ignorant and ex and, and excused them. Uh, on account uh, of it. Um, six, let me just have a sip of water. Um, now, um, before um, before moving on to the next point, um, I'd, I'd like to quickly uh, I'd like to quickly comment on an argument. <clears throat> which uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi raised. Now, this concerns Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Now, Dr. Yasir Qadi argued that Allah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Prophet Isa alayhi salam the power to raise the dead, the power to resurrect the dead. And uh, Dr. Yasir said, let us imagine that a Muslim, during the time of Prophet Isa alayhi salam, um, asked him to raise somebody from the dead while believing that he could only do so by the permission of Allah. Dr. Qadi argues that, that uh, this is not shirk akbar, uh, but, if, but if there were somebody who made the same exact request in the same exact manner, yet believed that Prophet Isa was God, then the act becomes one of shirk. Um, I mean, first of all, there there are a number of of, of there are a number of, of points uh, to consider here. Um, you know, uh, 
first of all, when we say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave Prophet Isa alayhi salam the power to resurrect the dead, what do we mean by that exactly? Um, do we mean that he gave him full discretional authority to raise from the dead um, whoever, uh, whenever, wherever, and as many as he wished, uh, all with the permission and oversight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Or is this some kind of partial and restricted ability to raise some of the dead only in s some specific circumstances in order to prove uh, his prophethood uh, with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Um, another question uh, we need to ask ourselves here is, is the action of resurrecting the dead um, one which is exclusive to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Is it from the khasa'is al-rububiyyah? Is this something which, which only Allah himself does? Well, many ulama thought so. Um, they do not believe that Prophet Isa salam acquired an ability to resurrect the dead. Uh, rather, they believe that he was merely used as a means or a, as a cause to perform, to perform certain actions and gestures. And in that point and instant, would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala intervene and resurrect the dead himself? Um, so, for example, Prophet Isa alayhi salam would, you know, could, would approach the grave and say, rise. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that instant would resurrect the dead himself, not Prophet Isa alayhi salam. Um, um, Imam al-Tabari uh, even said that, that, that the dead were resurrected uh, when Prophet Isa alayhi salam uh, would make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have the dead resurrected, and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself would resurrect the dead. So there's a big difference here. There, there's a big difference between saying that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala resurrected the dead himself by using Isa alayhi salam as a means, versus saying that Isa alayhi salam was given the, uh, the ability and power to raise the dead himself. Uh, and uh, with the oversight and permission uh, uh, of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So uh, I think Dr. Yasir Qadi needs to interact with these opinions uh, and make himself clearer as to what he believes. Uh, does he believe that resurrecting the dead is something exclusive to Allah only if done so independently? And if yes, does he believe the same thing for other things like forgiveness of sins, granting hidayah, uh, etc.? Um, and how do we know that Prophet Isa salam, was even given this discretional uh, ability and authority as opposed to the explanation uh, offered by so many other ulama? Um, and which classical ulama did, uh, d uh, d you know, um, uh, you know, agree with Dr. Yasir Qadi, and and w and why is his stance stronger than the others? So that would be good to know, so that we could assess the strengths of the differing opinions. And uh, but you know, since uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi promised to not have a back and forth, we we might not find out. Um, uh, um, m moreover, uh, how how is uh, Dr. Yasir Qadi going, you know, how far is he going to go here? So let's say that Prophet Isa alayhi salam um, is alive and still has this unconditional ability to, to resurrect the dead with the permission of Allah. Uh, and someone is constantly calling out to him, slaughtering for him, to appease him, and, and making sujood out of mere respect, not worship, but out of respect and fasting for him, and doing everything for him without intending worship, um, and pleading to him to, to raise his dead mother back to life, this does not amount in a collective and holistic sense to major shirk committed by an ignoramus um, in the eyes of Dr. Yasir Qadi? Or am I missing something in the hypothetical scenarios he's providing? Um, all in all, uh, I believe Dr. Yasir Qadi's argument requires uh, a little more work to be put into it uh, before we permit it to make us uh, reconsider 
to you know to radically reconsider uh, changing our you know conception uh, uh, of ibadah. Um, uh, now there's so much to say, and and I can say a lot. Uh, and this video is already becoming way way longer than I than I would like it to be. So uh, let me let me give you some homework, I guess. Um, now. Uh, Dr. Qadi mentioned uh, Dr. Sultan al umayri uh, in his video, and, and he spoke positively about him and, and the kinds of arguments uh, he uses. Um, uh, uh, and, and that's good, because others are not so fair when, when it comes to how they speak of Dr. Sultan. Um, now, Dr. Sultan has authored a book uh, called... Um, تحقيق الإفادة بتحرير مفهوم العبادة and and the book you know which um, uh, alhamdulillah yours truly had the honor and privilege of of contributing to um, um, has one primary goal uh, namely refuting those who say that in order for ibadah to take place uh, one must believe that his object of veneration and and glorification has the attribute of of self sufficiency of of in, of true independence of God's will. Um, uh, and, and the book, Alhamdulillah, uh, you know, refutes this understanding. Um, and even though Doctor Yasser Qadi doesn't appear to be fully embracing uh, this understanding, uh, based on some of the remarks that he made. Uh, this, the book still pretty much also addresses um, most of the arguments that Dr. Uh, that Dr. Yasser Qadi used uh, in support of his stance, um, especially when it comes to the ayat that Dr. Qadi mentioned and his analysis of what the Quraysh believed and so on. So, you know, make sure you read it, please, because I, I don't want to tackle the, the beliefs of Quraysh in this video because that would, quite frankly... Just add another another hour or an hour and a half to this video, and 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 you know if you're a serious researcher, inshallah, you will read and and investigate yourself. Um, if you cannot read Arabic, uh, since the book is uh, only available in Arabic, um, you have uh, a number of choices. Uh, one is ask your local sheikh, uh, ask your local sheikh to read the book and teach it to you. Or ask a uh, you know uh, a teacher that you look up to, to 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 study the book and to teach it to you and and your and your friends. Um, another thing you could do is maybe wait for the English translation of the book to come out. Um, maybe inshallah the you know the English translation of the book might come out this year. Or maybe next year tops, inshallah. Uh, I'm supposed to be proofreading it, uh, so um, but I'm still not sure when it will be made available. Uh, so I don't want to promise, but inshallah, maybe this year. Um, uh, another thing that you could do, and this is the least ideal thing, but it's better than nothing. Uh, you could check out an article on my on my Medium page uh, called "Defining Ibadah." So you could go to Google and type uh, Bassam Zawadi defining ibadah medium. So Bassam Zawadi defining ibadah medium. And inshallah, you should be able to find it. Uh, uh, in it, I try to summarize some of the key foundational ideas of the book. And uh, it does not do complete justice to the book since it is the book which provides all the citations and addresses each of the arguments in detail. Uh, but nevertheless, the principles which I summarize in the article could prove beneficial, inshallah, to several of you. Uh, so do check it out if you're if you're unable to read Arabic. Um, and also for you Arabic readers, uh, you know, do keep a lookout for Dr. Sultan al um, uh upcoming roughly 1,800-page uh, sharh of uh, Kitab al-Tawheed, which, uh, inshallah might be published this year or, or next. Uh, in it, he discusses this topic in greater detail um, and discusses when um, conditional acts of ibadah, such as you know slaughtering, seeking refuge, istighatha, etc., constitute uh, 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 ibadah. Now, with that said, um, I'd like to move on and, and um, 
and and cover a few other points in in Dr. Yasser Qadi's video. Um, he spoke about the harms. He spoke about the harms of focusing on the problems of other Muslims. Okay, and and how we need to think about matters of greater priority uh, to the Ummah and and whatnot. Now, it's important to realize that that your perception of something heavily depends on how you frame that thing. So let's imagine this. Um, let's imagine that you have a bunch of Muslims who are drinking alcohol. And someone is constantly reminding them and urging them not to do so. Now, how could you frame this situation? Now, you could either say, excuse me, now you could either say, the brother is, is, is giving them nasiha. Say, okay, mashallah, giving nasiha is good. That sounds like a good thing. Or you could say, uh, the brother is um, trying to eliminate the munkar with his tongue. He is trying to use his speech to bring about the end of the munkar of alcohol drinking. Once again, mashallah, that, that sounds like the brother is following the prophetic command on this point. Or you could say that the brother is too focused on the problems of other Muslims. Now that doesn't sound so nice, now does it? Now the question here is, how should things be framed when we are discussing our differences with others when it comes to the conception of ibadah? Now, if you, the athari, if you, the athari, truly believe that there are acts of major shirk being ignorantly practiced in the ummah, do you feel that you should, with wisdom and good conduct, of course, uh, an extremely exceptionally important caveat uh, that, that, that should not be undermined, um, um, you know, do you feel that you should warn others about this? Or do you want to rest your mind and sleep easy at night and, and not think too much about it and live and let live? Something which Dr. Yasser Qadi is, is urging you all to do. Um, do you think it's an exaggeration on your part to warn others about these practices? Or do you agree with your scholars who say that, this, that these acts are one of the worst innovations in our ummah? You make up your minds after you've determined what your stance is on the matter. Now, Dr. Yasser Qadi um, said that there are other issues affect, affecting the ummah. And there are. And he's right. It's wrong to neglect them. But it's also wrong to neglect this issue if you believe it's a serious issue. The solution is not to call people to neglect things which we personally feel are not of immediate importance, but rather that we all collectively ensure that we do not restrict, restrict our efforts to only dealing with certain problems you know, that, that the Ummah is facing at the expense of, of, of letting other problems go, attend, go unattended to. Now, not every single one of us could address all the problems in the ummah, um, and and we need to look, we need to take a, a good look at the state of the ummah, and 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 to look at our own ilmi interests and our own skill sets, and ask ourselves, how can I best serve the ummah? Um, what problems is the ummah facing, where there is a dearth of attention uh, being put into, uh, uh, into into their remedy? Um, what academic or social or whatever skills do I have which could best serve the Ummah? And once you've answered those questions for yourself and prayed istikhara, well, inshallah, you've pretty much found your calling. 
so pursue it. And and and, and um, uh, another point that I would like to address is is Dr. Yasser Qadi's claim that Athari beliefs regarding saint veneration and invocation being major acts of shirk are dangerous. He also did not make any distinction between those Atharis who make excuses of ignorance for the actor engaging in these acts and those who do not. He didn't differentiate between any kind of Athari. Regardless, according to Dr. Yasser Qadi, just believing that the saint veneration performed by those claiming to be Muslims is major shirk is dangerous. Now, I have no doubt in my mind that Sheikh Yasser Qadi does not intend atharis any harm with these words. And, you know, I'm, uh, I know he does not intend atharis any harm with those words, but I urge him, I urge him to not use such vo vocabulary for what is a common belief amongst all members of a Muslim group, especially given the kind of climate we are in and how several enemies of Islam out there with harmful agendas against Muslims could and would happily use his words for harmful purposes against Atharis. I pray, inshallah, that he's more wary of the descriptive labels he's using here. Um, I, I mean, when, when I, and when Dr. Yasser Qadi uses terms like ISIS and Wala'u Bara and Takfir in the same sentence, again, I pray because of the climate we are in, that he is more careful about how we discuss these terms. Um, I'm not saying that he's not entitled to put forth his argument if that's what he truly believes, but but these are the sorts of things that people are better off writing rather than expressing verbally and spontaneously off the cuff because when we write, we tend to express ourselves much more carefully. Now, with that out of the way, I mean, I just want to go back to the original point. Is the ethery belief that these acts of saint veneration and invocation being major shirk dangerous? Well, many ideas could be quite dangerous when they are applied recklessly and foolishly by ignoramuses who have no wisdom have no uh, sense of uh, of masalih wa mafasid no sense of harms and benefits that could come out of their actions um, have no respect for the rule of law have no understanding of fiqh etc I, I mean let's ask another question is the idea, is the idea that there is a punishment for the one who insults the Prophet wasallam? is that a dangerous idea? I mean, we've, we, we've seen how in certain countries, how there have been unruly mobs who have engaged in vigilante killings of people that they've accused of insulting the Prophet wasallam. Now, is the opinion regarding the punishment for the one who insults the Prophet ﷺ, which is firmly established in the juristic madahib, is it a dangerous opinion because it has been misused to shed blood? Um, how about the juristic opinion that the one who abandons the prayer without an excuse is a kafir? Is that dangerous? Should we erase it from the books of fiqh? Should we warn against those who adopt that opinion? Um, how about the claim of Imam al-Nawawi in his uh, Rawdat al-Talibin when he states that those who do not declare Christians to be kuffar or even have doubts that Christians are kuffar are themselves kuffar even if they claim to be Muslims. Well, in our era of ignorance, there are many Muslims in countries like Syria, Egypt, Pakistan, uh, and other countries that do not say that the Christians and Jews are kuffar. They say, no, they're not kuffar, they're Ahlul Kitab. 
They don't even know what a kafir is. I have direct family members that say that. Should we declare them kuffar? Should I do so at my next family reunion? Is the statement of Imam al Nawawi a dangerous statement? Look, I can give hundreds of examples here. And the point I'm trying to make here is clear. If it is up to the person whether he wants to isolate these statements and stances and, and totally ignore everything else that scholarship has to say and then go ahead and do something reckless and senseless. Alhamdulillah, the vast majority of atharis are law-abiding people who understand that very well. And I pray, inshallah, that Dr. Yasser Qadi is a bit more careful with his choice of words. He wants to go after ISIS? Go right ahead. But please don't label the beliefs of all atharis as dangerous just like that. Especially when we are already having plenty of antagonistic enemies already trying to do that. Now, when it comes to Ibn Abdul Wahhab and, and the charges of extreme chain takfir, and allegations of war crimes being perpetrated and whatnot. For me, with the relatively little I've read from both sides, I was personally not able to comfortably, definitively, and holistically choose a single side in this debate. And that will frustrate many people who have. And wallahi al-azim, I swear, it's not my intention to frustrate anybody. Look, you speak to a sympathizer and defender of Ibn Abdul Wahhab, and you see what he has to say. Um, his perspective is, uh, you know, is uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers were were preaching peacefully, and they were harassed and kicked out of towns and had rulings of takfir and tabdi' issued against them. Um, they were incited against. There were calls to have them killed. Um, they were attacked first, and, and they initially fought out of self-defense. Um, it is not true that Ibn Abdul Wahhab made takfir of most of the ummah. Um, in fact, Ibn Abdul Wahhab has explicit statements where he said that he does not believe that the majority of the ummah uh, are guilty of shirk. It is... It is not true that Ibn Abdul Wahhab said that the Ummah uh, does not know uh, the meaning of La ilaha illallah. Rather, he was only referring to a specific region, the region of Arud, in, in, which was a part of Nej, which is a part of Najd, and in particular, in particular reference to 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 uh, uh, to the Bedouins, and 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 there are. Other statements from non-Nejdis which confirm just how bad and rampant uh, deviancy was in the region. Um, um, uh, Ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers um, uh, attacked towns which reneged on, on, uh, on their peace treaty with them and sought to kill their preachers and they used their towns as political centers of resistance against him and his followers. Um, um, uh, you, you know, they had no choice but to expand and grow um, uh, militarily because it was necessary for them to gain strength and solidify their borders. And 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 uh, you know, because they knew that if they didn't do that, that they would eventually be crushed and eliminated, etc., etc., etc. Those are the kinds of arguments sympathizers and and defenders of Ibn Abdul Wahhab put forth. And then the other side speaks, um, and you know, and they say things like, Ibn Abdul Wahhab was a takfiri. He was causing fitna. Of course he should have been resisted against because he was a kharijite. That's what you do to kharijites. You resist them and you fight them. He was absolutely intolerant. He, 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 not only did he make takfir of so many people, he even made takfir of people who did not agree with his takfir of, of those people. Um, him and his followers committed war crimes. They massacred Muslims. They took their women, Muslim women. They took them as captives. He attacked Muslim cities and towns unprovoked. 
um, he did not merely hold a controversial opinion. He, he gained military strength and put his thoughts into destructive practice, which led to great shedding of Muslim blood. And over what? Over something that's not even considered major shirk to begin with. Etc., etc., etc. And those are the kinds of things you'd hear a critic of Ibn Abdul Wahhab say. Tens of thousands of pages have been authored by both sides arguing their case. You're dealing with something in the past, and you're not seeing with your own eyes everything that went down. Now, I'm not going to dedicate hundreds of hours of my research time to this issue. As, as Dr. Yasser Qadi himself said, there are other priorities in the Ummah worth investing our time in. This is not it for me. Um, my personal theological beliefs will not change one bit regardless of the outcome of any research I decide to pursue on this subject. I will not engage in chain takfir whether or not I find out that this is what Ibn Abdul Wahhab did. And I will most certainly not go out and start killing people even if I find out that this is what Ibn Abdul Wahhab did. My iman and theological madhab is not interlinked with the actions of individual fallible men. I'm interested in ideas and concepts. And I encourage you and urge you all to, to, to think the same way. Similarly, I will not defend what Ibn Abdul Wahhab and his followers did blindly. Nor will I throw the baby out with the bathwater. I will suffice by saying, that if the truth of the matter is that Ibn Abdul Wahhab committed chain takfir and had women and children killed, then I condemn him and his actions. If that is the truth, then I condemn him. But again, I'm not throwing the baby out with the bathwater. Ibn Abdul Wahhab's moral character and military and political decisions is one thing, and his notion of takfir is another thing. And his conception of ibadah is another thing. And his ruling of certain actions to be ibadah or shirk is another thing altogether. I do adopt, I do adopt Ibn Taymiyyah's stance that invoking the dead from afar and asking them to fulfill your needs and, and, and whatnot is major shirk. This is the belief of every single athari. Um, you know, from, from the most strict and extreme down to uh, the, the most lenient and mild. This is a belief that virtually all ethereans agree on, and people will need to deal with that, and they would need to come to grips with that. Moreover, I do believe that an Islamic state would have the responsibility to eradicate, and with force, if need be, such ugly practices. Uh, so I will not mince my words on this point. Even if I did not believe that these practices were major shirk and were merely haram, I still believe as a matter of principle that, that open and despicable practices of munkar, such as asking the dead themselves to fulfill your need, to fulfill your needs, um, you know, th th this should be eradicated by force by an Islamically governed state. Um, you know, and obviously, as it does so, we would expect it to, um, to, to weigh the masalih and mafasid of such a move because Muslim blood is not to be taken lightly. Um, and I believe that there are very good arguments from the Quran and Sunnah, uh, backed up by the practices of the, uh, of the companions and the, and, and, and the Salaf, uh, to support that stance. Um, this is a, a serious issue. Um, one cannot request uh, an athari to just live and let live when it comes to this issue. But is this not um, a huge impediment for the different Islamic groups to fully embrace each other? It is. It sure is. But which side should compromise? Should the side that, believe, that believes it's shirk compromise? Or should the side 
that doesn't even believe it's fard to invoke dead saints compromise by putting an end to this practice? Is it more fair to ask the side to tolerate something as a valid difference of opinion when in their minds that something is undoubtedly evil? Or is it more fair to ask the side which doesn't even think it's haram to end this practice, to end this practice. If the call to unity and embracing each other is truly sincere, then let the side which compromises far less extend an olive branch and do what's required from their end. Otherwise, we're, we're just going to remain stuck in this little deadlock here. Um, and, and I guess in a way that's fine as it's technically possible to coexist peacefully and, and cooperate, but that tension will undoubtedly remain. So, back to Ibn Abdul Wahhab, in a nutshell, do your own research, or don't do your own research. It's your choice. My advice is that, as a priority, stick to researching ideas and, and notions not people, most especially if it's going to take hundreds of hours of your time to do justice to researching those issues. Um, you know, reading every rebuttal and counter-rebuttal and reading all the sources and verifying whether the sources are, are reliably attributed to their authors and, and reading the different studies and conclusions reached by different people and weighing the strengths and weaknesses of each stance, that's going to take a lot of time. And if you don't even know Arabic, you're probably not even going to be able to do all that properly. And that's even assuming that you're going to come out out of all this with a definitive conclusion. And if you do decide to research the subject, then don't merely look at what transpired, but also examine the events through a juristic and, and, and theological lens to determine what actions, uh, you know, to, to determine what actions committed were, were definitely wrong, uh, definitely right, or what was opening to differing viewpoints. And, and that's referring to both sides. Ibn Abdul Wahhab and his opponents who weren't necessarily angelic in their behavior, by the way. Don't let anybody try to guilt trip you or make you feel like you're immoral and this is a message to the Atharis listening. Don't let anybody try to guilt trip you or make you feel like you're immoral just because you're not casting negative moral judgments on Ibn Abdul Wahhab. You're not obliged in the Sharia to hold any stance about any fallible man, um, you know, uh, especially when it requires an extreme level of effort to do so. At the same time, again, this is ad advice directed to Atharis, do make sure that you don't defend Ibn Abdul Wahhab blindly either. Especially if you haven't done sufficient research. It works both ways. Don't appear before Allah on the Day of Judgment, possibly having to answer for why you defended oppressive actions. Watch out for yourself. Stick to ideas and concepts. Now, the final point which I would like to discuss is, is Dr. Yasser Qadi himself. Um, I'd like to read out something to, to all of you. Um, it's something which Dr. Yasser Qadi himself said in one of his classes. Sorry, let me just have a sip of water. It's something that uh, Dr. Yasser Qadi said in one of his classes. Listen carefully to this. And I quote, You know when somebody moves on, it's human nature. You look at the murtads that leave Islam, and you find them always talking about Islam. And to a certain level, it applies to anybody, including myself.
that leaves a group and you feel a sense of hurt and pain. And I'll tell you why. Because you feel a sense of betrayal. You're like, man, I believed in all this. So there is a sense of anger. And I can recognize this even as my blood boils. You see, subhanAllah, the academic side of me and the human side of me are clashing right now. I can see my own irritation at the movement I used to be part of for 20 years because I feel betrayed. That How could they have taught me this? And that irritation comes out. Anybody who is with a movement, any Christian who leaves Christianity, any Muslim who leaves Islam, any Sufi who leaves Sufism, any Najdi who leaves Najdiism, you can't help but feel a little bit extra angry at the movement you were with. And that's why I need to always keep myself in check. And again, try to be as unbiased as possible. End quote. Now, and I, I guess, I guess from this point on in the video, I think my my remarks are mostly directed to etheries, to the etheries listening to me. As you can see, Dr. Yasser Qadi is trying to deal with his past. He is bottling up feelings of resentment against the Atheri school. He is angry. He feels betrayed. He feels hurt. He feels pain. This is not my psychological analysis of him. This is what he says of himself. Now, those negative sentiments of Dr. Yasser Qadi would obviously correspond to the newly acquired perception he has of the Athari school. Um, he's trying his best to appear neutral and to appear like this isn't an issue that's bothering him that much anymore, but it clearly is. And, and, he, and he said what he said. Just about a year ago. So this isn't, some, this isn't an old statement of his. Um, and, and, and you, the Etheries, are just going to have to expect that Dr. Yasser Qadi will not stop criticizing your school. No matter how many times he tells everybody that we shouldn't be discussing these polemical issues, he himself will continue to periodically and frequently discuss these issues as he has been doing for the past, past decades since he left Etheriism. Now, he himself, as I quoted him, compared himself to a murtad who leaves Islam and can't escape the shadows of his past. Many murtads, after leaving Islam, are defined by their past. Ex-Muslim, that's their identity. Their past defines them. And it appears to be the same for Dr. Yasir Qadi. He is that ex-Salafi. Others who have left Atharism and joined other schools are not like that. There are many people who have left Atharism and they've really moved on emotionally and intellectually. Atheism didn't work for them. They found something else they feel works for them, and they moved on. It's not a mission in their lives to warn people about the great evil Salafi school. They've really moved on. No negative sentiments, no feelings of betrayal and anger. They've moved on, but Dr. Yasser Qadi still hasn't. And there are many others out there like him. So you Atheris need to bear this in mind. And so I guess what I'm really trying to say is this. Unless Dr. Yasser Qadi brings up a new argument, which is worthy of a rebuttal, there's really no need to react each time he repeats the same talking points. Especially on this subject. Because Dr. Yasser Qadi's arguments on this subject are virtually a copy paste from those from other sects who sects whom your ulama have been responding to all these decades we literally 
could identify the books and authors that he took his, or where he took these arguments from. But when they're presented by somebody like Dr. Yasser Qadi, these arguments have the illusion of appearing novel. Look, Dr. Yasser Qadi was an ardent athari. He was a passionate athari. He, was, he strongly believed in the cause. Those who studied with him in Medina testify that he was overly, overly involved in refutation culture, overly involved in refuting other theological groups. He was even trying to seek fatawa from mashayikh like Sheikh Abdullah al Ghunayman and, and Ibn al Uthaymeen, you know, to, 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 to refute Ash'aris only to be advised that it was best to teach the people the foundations of their religion and the foundations of their creed. So he was that passionate athari, overly concerned with refuting Islamic sects. Dr. Yasir Qadi himself also informed us that he was quite the confrontational person and that might have possibly led to his feelings of of alienation as he was passionately and assertively propagating his views. And as a result, a growing number of people perhaps distanced themselves from him. And that kind of prodded him to investigate his beliefs and, and, and moved on to something else. But he didn't move on to another theological school like Ash'ariism or Maturidism. He's kind of without a theological madhab now where he takes important elements from here and important elements from there. He's neither here, he's neither there. Many have seen how Sheikh Yasir Qadi evolved after attending Yale. His threshold of, of, of tolerance, of differing views, is much wider than any Sunni theological school would allow. For example, and this is and this is this isn't the biggest example, but for example, he says our differences with the Mu'tazila on the issue of sifat is down to linguistics and how we express ourselves. Any athari or ashari or maturidi theologian would scoff at such a strange and evidently false conclusion. And sifat it's supposed to be Dr. Yasser Qadi's area of specialization. Dr. Yasser Qadi compares himself to Ibn Aqil al-Hanbali before he repented. Ibn Aqil was charged by his fellow Hanbalis for praising al-Hallaj and for being affected by Mu'tazilite thought. Dr. Yasser Qadi praised Ibn Aqil as a forward-thinking Hanbali because he was brave enough to oppose his fellow traditionalist Hanbalis before they forced him to repent. Why would Dr. Yasser Qadi compare himself to somebody like Ibn Aqil al-Hanbali before he repented? Out of all people you could compare yourself to, and aspire to emulate. Is that who you see yourself to be like? It's not that Dr. Yasir Qadi is saying that he's sympathetic to Al-Hallaj and I'tizal. No, of course not. But the, 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 the idea of being this loner opposing the rest of the traditionalists, he feels that. Why feel that way? Dr. Yasir Qadi in his video said that one of the things that encouraged him to reinvestigate his beliefs was that he was curious as to why his views were held by a minority in the 21st century. Well, at least when, when Dr. Yasir Qadi was an ethari, he was part of an established school with its respected scholars and institutions and masajid and whatnot. Now he appears to have adopted no recognizable theological school and appears to be fine with opposing everybody else by having adopted a customized packaged selection of stances. 
So will that now consistently encourage him to do another self-introspection as to whether what he's upon today true or not? Time will tell. And inshallah, I pray that he at the very least gets the emotional closure that he's seeking. And I think there are lessons to be learned from the mistakes Dr. Yasir Qadi committed back in his Athari days. Not everybody is the kind of, not every Athari is the kind of Athari Dr. Yasir Qadi used to be. We should not allow the personal experiences of a single individual be projected on to everybody else. But we could and should learn from the mistakes that he committed. And this brings me to, to my final point. And, 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 and you know, just to bring this entire thing to a close, we need to acknowledge the valid points which Dr. Yasser Qadi raised in his video. You know, regarding displaying hostility towards others, uh, you know, absolutely refusing to cooperate with others, um, neglecting other extremely important uh, causes in the ummah. All of these things are valid points, which Dr. Yasser Qadi raised in his video. Atharis, um, you know, Atharis need, and the advice goes to the other groups as well, but... Uh, because <laughs> uh, I'm an Athari myself, I'm, I'm directing this to Atharis. Atharis need to, to contextualize all those narrations about the Salaf's treatment of innovators. Boycotting and shunning served certain purposes back then, and they were effective during a time when the falsehood of the innovators was virtually clear to everybody and the innovators numbered so few with all the noise regarding the jahmis they only numbered in a, in the few hundreds tops but when you're not that majority anymore uh, you need to assess whether the maqasid of boycotting and shunning are are being actualized each time in each place, and with each group or set of individuals, you plan to do that to. You know, the, 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 the purpose and, and, and wisdom of engaging in these actions has to be assessed on a periodical basis. Um, you know, as, as opposed to just blindly reading what the Salaf did and completely ignoring the maqasid they were hoping to acquire as a result of their boycotting and shunning. They did it to become stronger and to curtail the spreading of deviancy. They didn't do it to isolate themselves from the rest of the ummah. There are very precious statements to consider in this regard, you know, from the likes of Ibn Taymiyyah and from more recent scholars like uh, Sheikh Al Bani, rahimahullah, and Sheikh, uh, you know, in his Silsila uh, Al Huda Wal Nur, and and Sheikh uh, Bakr Abu Zaid, and others, and cooperation could happen without compromising your beliefs. It could also happen without validating the beliefs of those whom you wish to cooperate with on specific matters in specific instances. However, if the price tag is uh, you know, if the price tag of cooperating with anybody is the compromise of your of your cherished stance, then don't cooperate with him. You know, and and, and unfortunately, there are people like that. They they want you to compromise. They want you to change your beliefs. They pretend to validate your theological school only to keep attacking it. Their idea of unity with you is that you stop believing in some of the core things you believe in, and then we'll get along. Watch out from these people. They outwardly claim they seek unity, but what they really have in mind is trying to change your beliefs a bit more diplomatically and slyly. They want to have the reputation 
that they are open-minded and against sectarianism and that they frown upon all these polemical theological debates only to engage in these very debates and discussions themselves. Watch out from these people, especially burnouts who just don't know how to psychologically move on in a mentally healthy manner after having left atheism. The kind of people you want to cooperate with are those who are openly honest about where they stand in their perspective of you and your school, and yet are willing to cooperate with you on specific matters on the condition that neither compromises their beliefs. Cooperate with these people in that which is good, as the Quran commands. This isn't my personal logic here. You know, the, the major ulama of the Salafi, uh, of the, you know, of the Athari or Salafi school ha- have, have spoken to that effect. So, subhanAllah, I mean, there's a lot to say on this specific subject of, of cooperation with others. I mean, you know, it's, it's worthy of an entire separate lecture itself. But, you know, and I don't wish to prolong this message um, any further. So, you know, in a nutshell, try your best to be balanced and don't burn yourself out and don't stick to one issue and cause in your life. Uh, think beyond your madhab. Think about the broader ummah and, and always assess priorities as they constantly change. And, uh, you know, I pray, inshallah, that, that the ummah grows to, to become more united in its ranks, despite the differences which will, which will remain in it, and, 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 and that we move together to, to better times, inshallah. Um, and with this, we conclude. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Shalom la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.